Hey, good morning. Thanks for tuning in again for another adult Bible study here on Sunday morning. We appreciate every week you guys continue to watch the videos that we're able to put together during our time of separation so we can continue to study the Bible together. And uh, this morning, I want us to kind of ask the question, how can I believe the Bible? I'm sure you've run into people before uh, that just have their doubts about whether the Bible is real, whether there is a God. And uh, sometimes we have to look at things of evidence and put things together from the Bible and things we found out about history or science or geography to kind of help uh, persuade that idea of them believing the gospel. And hopefully uh, they will turn to not only just believing because of their evidence, but believing because of a faith. Uh, because ultimately that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to believe and trust in him based on faith and not just simply evidence of things. But here's some things that maybe you can, you can look at on your own. You can also talk to other people about uh, to kind of introduce them to reasons that they can believe in the Bible. So I think the first thing you have to keep in mind is what a lot of people that come from a science community that don't come from a religious background are going to do. It's called the secular view. And what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to say, well, the Bible, number one, it makes a claim. Maybe example, it would say, well, so-and-so was the king of Israel during this time. And then they'll go to science or they'll go to history and, and neither one of those have verified that claim. And so therefore they'll say, well, the Bible can't be true because the Bible says this, but science doesn't say this or history doesn't say that. And it's a very unreliable method because, well, we're constantly updating, aren't we? We're constantly finding out new things through archaeology about this world that we live in, about science, about history, and about medicine. And so don't be confused or let someone dismiss something that's written in the Bible simply because, well, science or history says, well, that's not accurate. We haven't found any evidence for that yet. This has happened over and over again. Another thing to keep in mind is the difference between scientific law and scientific theory. Okay, you've heard of scientific laws as far as like the law of thermodynamics or the law of gravity. Okay, what those basically mean is, is that's a standard. Everybody believes that. No one disputes it. It predicts results. Okay, it's basically what happens. What happens with uh, gravity? We have a law to tell us all about that. That is very different than scientific theory because scientific theory is simply based on, well, what is the most logical explanation of why things happen the way they do? So theory answers the question why, but it doesn't mean it can't be changed. Theory is basically just the best explanation, uh, and that can be changed over time through experimentation. Probably the most popular scientific theory uh, that you hear all the time and our kids are even taught in their schools unfortunately is the idea of evolution uh, because basically science has said well this is the most logical explanation of why we're here because they don't believe in a higher being or god look at this for an example these are a lot of things that at one time were taught or thought as scientific theories but now none of them are none of them are taught none of them are talked about uh, because they've been proven wrong. Uh, and that's what happens with theories. So don't let someone confuse what is a scientific theory that just answers why, which is, well, this is probably the most logical answer to it, although we don't know for sure. Now, let's look at some of these uh, examples of what we can see in the Bible that people have to be just really, really, really smart or just really, really, really lucky to have written these things and them come to be true, or there is a God, there is a higher being, and we can believe the Bible because we'd have to answer the question, why else would someone have written something as strange as this? And now what we found out. So Genesis 17, verse 12, for example, this is when God is giving uh, the commands to Abraham of what now is gonna be done now that there's a covenant, now that he's gonna be the father of all nations, he says in verse 12, he says, For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are not of your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with money, they must be circumcised. That was one of the standards, one of the symbols of God's people. 
But the question is, why eight days? Have you ever wondered that? Why did he tell them eight days? So what we have found out now through the study of medicine over the years, that the eighth day is perfect, a perfect day for surgery. Well, why is that? Well, you need three things, all right, that are needed for the blood to clot. All right, we're told vitamin K, uh, prothrombin, and platelets. All right, and so what we found and discovered is if the blood doesn't clot in your body, well, then it can hemorrhage, go to your brain, you could die, right? Well, what we also found out is day one of a human being's life, your body is at 90% of its throat open. And then days two through five, it actually goes down and drops to only 30%. So it's a very dangerous time to try to have surgery. And then all of a sudden, day eight, your prothrombin jumps up to 110%. Now you could say, well, is that a coincidence? Or is that God knew exactly how our bodies work because he created them. So therefore he said, this is the most significant time. This is the best time for circumcision to happen on young boys is on the eighth day. Here's something else in the lines of medicine that we figured out. So in 1847, there was a doctor from Hungary who went to Vienna to work. And he was working in the area of the hospital where they were delivering babies. And at that particular time, they had this area was divided into two sections. They had one division where the doctors were delivering the babies and, a, and another division where the midwives were delivering the babies. And as he started doing research, he saw that on the side where the doctors were delivering babies, that they had anywhere from 18 to 50 percent death rate, depending on the time of the year when doctors were delivering the babies. But yet on the midwife side, they only had a 3% death rate. And this really perplexed this doctor. He wanted to figure this out. So he started doing research. And he would check with other hospitals. He would uh, run different experiments as far as, you know, was it the position that the mother was in when she was giving uh, birth? Was it uh, even the wild things like the priest was ringing the bells and was it scaring the mothers and you know all these different things that he would try to experiment to try to figure out why is the death rate so much higher when you had these uh, medical doctors that were delivering these babies and finally he found out the problem he was watching the doctors and even the students that were learning from the doctors they were going from working on dead bodies to the next room to deliver babies. And so what he did was he started making changes. He started making everyone wash their hands with chlorinated water before examining the patients. And lo and behold, the death rate dropped to 1%. What's more amazing about that is that people were furious about this extra procedure he was wanting people to go through washing the hands so he was eventually fired he was called names he was sent home and so he took his research and he started implementing the same procedures in another clinic home and guess what happened death rates dropped he sent out letters uh, to other clinics telling him about this even though no one would believe him for a while so why do I bring that up well you look on numbers chapter 19 in verse 11 and 12 and it says whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days they must purify themselves with the water on the third day and on the seventh day and then they will be clean but if they do not purify themselves on the third and the seventh day they will not be clean what you found here in numbers is there was this purification cycle uh, God understood and therefore he passed on the message to his people for instructions if you were to come in contact or dealing with a dead body because we understand now the idea of germs so what happened well you look at actually the first part of numbers chapter 19 it gives um, these instructions and feel free to pause the video and if you want to read those but in verses 2 and 5 and 9 especially it mentions these these certain things that are needed when basically the people of God would purify themselves 
The first thing that's mentioned is this idea of lie. And you may say, well, what is lie? Well, basically what we know is um, it eats through things like germs. Uh, this is how you make, uh, you use this to make lye soap. Maybe you've heard of that before. Uh, and it's especially still used today, this idea of lye, when you get high doses of things like Drano, you know, declogging agents. They still use uh, lye in those soaps. The second thing is hyssop. And hyssop is maybe something you've heard a little bit before. That was the uh, that was it's a plant and it's a plant that was actually used to uh, try to give Jesus water uh, or, or yeah, to give Jesus something to drink while he was on the cross. This was the plant that was used to spread the blood over the doorpost um, during the Passover. Well, hyssop is a plant and what we know about it is a, it has a germ killing agent called thymol in it. And it's found actually in many of our mouthwashes. Uh, the idea that alcohol kills germs. And then the third thing that's mentioned there in the first part of Numbers 19 is this idea of scarlet wool. And scarlet wool is basically this thick, this itchy wool. You don't, you don't really want to wear this, right? It makes uh, this concoction they were making up, the texture of the soap, it would make it gritty. And so then it would release the dirt, you know, as you scrub it on your body to scrub it off. We look at these things as this was their first initial type of soap that they would use to purify themselves. Now, then you would ask yourself the question, well, how do they know to do that? How do they know these certain products together would purify their bodies? Well, they wouldn't have known it unless God told them. It's another way we can believe in the Bible. The unfortunate thing is it took many, many centuries for people to actually catch on to this because of the spread of germs. In fact, you talk about you know germs and things like that. We're told in Leviticus chapter 11 that God's people were told of certain laws about eating. You know, even the idea of eating meats. Right, and you've probably heard this one before where they were told they could eat the beast with the hoof and eat cud, you know, cows, for example. They were okay to eat, but pigs were not okay to eat. And you may say, well, why weren't pigs? You know, what was wrong with pigs? Well, they didn't eat cud. And they were basically what we call scavengers. You know, they would go around and pigs will eat whatever is thrown in front of them, and therefore they would carry parasites. And if you don't properly cook that meat, even today, if you don't properly cook pigs uh, in the meat there, you could become very, very sick because of it. So God said, no pigs. He, he also said, don't eat bats, which sounds like a strange thing for us. Why would you want to eat a bat anyway? But, you know, we learn now that bats actually carry rabies. They wouldn't have known that back then unless God would have told them. And that's why God set these standards to say, don't eat these things. And now we realize it through modern technology, through science, of why he told them certain things were okay to eat, certain things were not okay to eat. He talked about fish. He said if fish, if they have scales and fins, they're okay to eat. But if they don't have both, then don't eat them. Well, why is that? Well, now we know that all poisonous fish, all the ones that we know about, are missing one of these two. For example, you may have heard of the puffer fish before. It's known to have 1,650% more toxic than cyanide. It's not only in medicine, it's not only in foods that we learn of how we can rely and, and trust the Bible because we understand that, that people wouldn't have just magically known to write these things down or know these things. These things came from God. The Bible also has inspiration when it comes to supporting, you know, things like geography, things like archaeology. There's been numerous discoveries that have been found basically confirming uh, various people and various places in the Bible. Now, let's look at a couple of these things. This was um, a section taken out of a book that was written in 1987 by this, this lady, Kathleen. And listen to what she says. She says, too many people, it seems remarkable, 
to, oh, to, to many people, it seems remarkable that David and Solomon still remain unknown outside of the Old Testament or literary sources derived directly from it. No extra-biblical inscription, either from Palestine or from a neighboring country, has yet been found to contain a reference to them. So what she's basically saying, in 1987, they still haven't found any evidence for King Solomon and King David of being real people. And, he, and she says, well, that is amazing, and it probably is amazing, considering what the Bible says about them, as far as them being the greatest kings and having so many riches and building the temple and all these things that happened. Well, you found just a few years later in 1993, there was this stone that was found uh, in the ancient city, Israelite city of Dan. There was this inscription on it that said, uh, that was talking about the Israelite king, talking about coming from the house of David. Here's one that is a little more lengthy but I think is a, is a pretty unique story. We've heard of Hezekiah maybe before in the Old Testament. And in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, they're not, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? The reason that may sound out of context or out of place, but stick with me here what it's saying basically this is something hezekiah did he brought a he made a tunnel and he brought the water into the city you turn over to second chronicles chapter 32 it makes an announcement about this it says the same hezekiah also stopped the water outlet in upper gihon and brought the water tunnel to the west side of the city of david so you look at those and say well what does that have to do with anything well it tells us who was the king it tells us what he did, and specifically about this idea of him bringing water into the city. Now, here's what's been found. This tunnel that Hezekiah actually built. This is, this is the picture of it that's been found through archaeological discoveries. What is amazing about it is there's a section of Hezekiah's tunnel that had this Salom inscription on it now it's been removed as you see from now but from from i think people who vandalized it but that's not before it was written down many many years ago and pictures have been taken and such and here's what this inscription said on the actual wall it said in 1880 uh well basically here's how it was found two boys swimming at the site discovered an inscription that told the details of the tunnel's construction now, here's what, the, here's what it said. It said, and this was the account of the breakthrough. While the laborers were still working with their picks each toward each other, and while there were still three cubits to be broken through, the voice of each was heard calling the other because there was a crack or a split or overlap in the rock from the south to the north. And at the moment of the breakthrough, the laborers struck each toward the other, pick against pick. And then water flowed from the spring to the pool for 1,200 cubits and the height of the rock above the heads of the laborers was 100 cubits. Now, so the first thing that's interesting about this, okay, we're talking about evidence, right? We're talking about archaeology that's been found. The Bible talks about Hezekiah building this tunnel and making water come through. Then we find the inscription on the actual tunnel itself that's been found that talks about how basically uh, a little bit of even their engineering back in the day, how they had one person on one side going down and the other person on the other side going up. And that had to, that had to um, take some sort of thought and process for them to match up together. It also talks about, uh, as it says, cubits. And sometimes we're confused about what a cubit is. Well, we can take that back and we can go and measure now with, uh, with, with our measuring tools and we can see exactly how far 1,200 cubits is. And guess what? It matches up. It matches up exactly the measurement of what the inscription says and what the Bible says that these people did. And if that was not enough information, then something on basically the other side of the spectrum that tells us a little bit about why Hezekiah did this to begin with is called the Taylor prism. 
And this was found in Nineveh by, as you can see the name here in 1830, and it, it tells you a little bit about it. It's this six-sided clay prism, and now it's, it's basically, um, I don't know if it's still in the Institute of Chicago, but that's where it was brought in the 18, uh, early 1900s. But here's what the portion of the text said on this Taylor prism. It says, as to Hezekiah, the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities, walled forts to the countless small villages of their vicinity, conquered them by means of a well-stamped earth ramps and battle rams. Himself I made prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with the earthwork in order to molest those who were leaving the city's gates. Uh, basically, this is the other side of the spectrum of, of who Hezekiah is hiding from. The Assyrians, how they were coming to take over. So basically, they, they instead of killing Hezekiah, they blocked him up in his own city in Jerusalem and wouldn't let him leave. And that's partially why Hezekiah needed this tunnel, this escape, and this water to come into the city. So what you have here is you got an ancient text telling us who the Assyrian king was. You got an ancient text telling us who the king of Judah was. You got an ancient text telling us the Assyrian king took all the cities. And then you read those corresponding verses in 2 Chronicles 3, or excuse me, 31, and then 2 Kings 18, 13. And you put this all together, it tells you the story of what's going on. This proves the idea that the Bible is reliable of what it says, of who is the king, of different locations and places. Now, if this is something that interests you, uh, and you want to read a little bit more about this, here's two different things you can kind of check out on your own time. The first is something called uh, it's www.isgenesishistory.com. Maybe some of you have seen. Uh, it's basically a video. Uh, I can't remember exactly how long it is. Sometimes you can find it on Netflix. Sometimes you can find it on uh, Amazon Prime, it just depends on, sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't, but you can definitely rent it for just a couple of dollars, and I recommend you to do that, because what this video does is it goes through some of the Genesis accounts and tells you how, as a Christian, these things came to be, whether it's about the flood, it's about creation, it's about fossils, it gives all these different um, stories of how the creation story and how Genesis can be accurate even in today's um, scientific realm. Because most scientists would say, well, it's, 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 it's fiction. It's not true. And so it gives you some, uh, if you're just fascinated about things like that, that's one resource for you. Another resource for you is the Apologetics Press. Uh, you probably have heard of these before. And in fact, they recently put out a Bible that is a, an Apologetics Express study Bible that has a lot of these evidence things sort of placed throughout as we talked a couple of videos ago about different study Bibles. Uh, but what you can find on the Apologetics Express, you can find videos, you can find um, dozens and dozens, I mean, hundreds of articles about all sorts of things like we talked about. Just just little snippets of one particular verse or one particular thing that really just backs up the evidence of proving that the Bible exists. At the end of the day, we all have to have faith in God. But I think we also understand that there's a lot of people in the world that don't have faith. And they need something to push them in a the direction of them realizing that the Bible is real, that God is real, that God is their creator, and that Jesus is their savior. And so these are just a few things and, and certainly we all wanna do even more research to have uh, proofs of evidence, basically to show people, to persuade them to at least listen to the gospel. And when we can get them to listen to the gospel, then I think they will really truly believe and have trust and faith because they'll understand who God is and who Jesus is. At the end of the day, this is all about just finding different techniques, different ways to teach people, whether it's our children and helping them understand the Bible is real, or uh, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, whoever it might be, because there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done even in our own town here of Cookville. There's a lot of people that don't believe in the Word of God. 
So hopefully these things have helped you a little bit and you can study even more. And if you uh, obviously if you find more evidence and different things, we'd love to hear those and uh, share those with each other. And maybe even when we get back, we can have at some point in time an adult class where we just share a lot of these evidence things that proves why we can believe in the Bible.